Holy Spirit, come and fill this place this morning.
Father God, we love you and we worship you. God, we say all praise and all glory and honor belong to you, Jesus. God, we love you. God, we're so thankful for what you're doing in our lives. God, we thank you that you've brought us through for another week. And God, you brought us here today so that we could worship you together as the body of Christ. Father God, let today be a, a day where we can build each other up, where we can be an encouragement, where we can hear from you directly, God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Father God, we ask that you would move in us and through us today. God, we would be sensitive to your, to your words, Father God. God, give us a heart and a desire and an attitude to want to grow in you. And God, today we would leave here a little different than the way that we came in. God, I pray for those who have needs today, Father God, that, that you would be the meter of those needs. God, whether it's financial, whether it's health, God, whatever it might be, that, that God, that you would be our supplier that, God, we would look to you first and foremost. God, we love you. God, we're so thankful for this time that we've had to, to worship you together. Open our hearts, open our ears, God, that we would hear everything that you're trying to say to us today. God, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Good morning, church. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us. If you're online today, thank you for joining us online. Before we get started, turn around and say hello to somebody. church good morning church there we are hey it is great to see you today thank you for being here and worshiping with us if you're online thank you for joining us online today uh, we just have a lot of different announcements that we want to go through so we'll be as quick as possible but efficient as well uh, first and foremost, if you are a guest with us, if you would help us out at the Welcome Center today after the service, there's a, a little card on the table that says connection card. We'd love to know that you were here today. If you've changed your address or your cell phone or your email or something like that, would you let us know by just stopping by the Welcome Center, filling one of these out? You can drop it off right there. Uh, we would love to send you a note saying thank you for being here and worshiping with us, and we'd love to update your, your information as well if you've been here for a while, but maybe you changed uh, some information uh, that way we can be efficient with getting you information about things that are going on at the church so if you could help us out with that that would be great uh, we want to let you know that uh, this evening there are two uh, small groups that are meeting uh, tonight at the both at the church the first one is the point man youth ministry small groups uh, we have a guys group and a girls group we get together at 6 30 from 6 30 to 8 o'clock we have uh, food and things like that before we break up into our small groups it's just a great time so we'd love to invite uh, students out to that that's open to anyone in the sixth grade through 12th grade and we meet in the youth building which is just located all the way around building uh, looks like a barn, but it's not really a barn. Uh, it's the only way to describe it, I think. So, uh, so that's tonight at 6:30. Also, at the same time, uh, Pastor Brad and Cheryl they host a small group. Uh, they'll be meeting up front in the CGS Kids Church Room. Again, uh, some some food is provided for that. And if you have any questions about that, uh, make sure you stop and see them as well. But uh, some different small groups that happen throughout the month. Uh, next week we have the 55 and up uh, small group. Uh, they will be meeting next Sunday right after church, also in the CGS Kids Room. Uh, they also provide food. Uh, they provide the main dish, and, uh, and then it's kind of like a potluck from there on out. They ask that you bring a side dish or a dessert to share. And then Alicia and I, we will be hosting a small group uh, next week. Normally, we meet on the last Sunday of the month, but uh, we've had to move it, so that will also meet next Sunday as well, Sunday evening. Uh, in the youth building. So if you have any questions about small groups, make sure you, you stop at the Welcome Center, ask. They'd love to give you more information about the small groups that meet throughout the month. Uh, 
When you walked in today, uh, you should have gotten a little card for the LifeWise Academy. Uh, LifeWise Academy uh, last year uh, kicked off at Eastwood, and things are going really well. And uh, we are in the process of trying to get LifeWise Academy and Elmwood started. And these are, these are great organizations designed to teach children the Word of God, and we're really excited about it. If you would like to go to an informational meeting, uh, it is this Tuesday, March 15th at 7 o'clock. Uh, the address is right there, 12965. I think I just passed my site test there. Uh, Defiance Pike uh, right outside of Signet. So if you have any questions about that, you can see me uh, or stop uh, at the tables in the back and pick up a card. Just as a reminder, uh, the more people there, it just helps get information out about it. And again, it's just a great opportunity to share the Word of God with, with uh, students uh, in the elementary. Coming up on April 28th, uh, the Bowling Green Pregnancy Center will be having their annual uh, gala. Uh, this is uh, the, one of their main fundraisers to uh, continue to be able to do the great work that the Pregnancy Center is doing. Uh, this year, the church will be hosting at least one table, and uh, we would like to invite you, if this is something that you would like to be a part of, something that you would like to help sponsor, uh, the seats are $30 a seat that covers your, your seat, your food, and uh, just really a, a great time. If, if you have any questions about that, you can see Pastor Brad or myself. Uh, there is a sign up sheet because there is somewhat limited seating. We need to know how many tables to get. So what we're asking is that when you sign up that you also pay at the Welcome Center at the same time so that way we have the right amount of seats uh, reserved for everybody. So it's $30 per, per person. If you have, have any questions about that, you can see myself or Pastor Brad. Uh, next week, we're starting a new life group series uh, called Liking Jesus. Life Groups uh, meets every Sunday morning at 9.30, uh, free breakfast, free coffee, uh, classes for all age groups. The adult class is starting this new series called Liking Jesus. It's a video and discussion series, uh, video taught by Craig Grishel, and then A.J. Haas uh, is going to be leading the, the discussion time. So uh, just a great opportunity to get to know people in the church, eat free breakfast, and, and grow in the Word of God as well. So that starts next week. And then just a reminder that Wednesday night is family night. Wednesday nights have been going really well. And uh, if you haven't come and been a part of it, we'd love to invite you out this week from 7 to 8, 10. Again, classes for all age groups. And we'd love to have you come and join us for that. Uh, we're going to take over our offering and lots of different ways that happens. If you're in-house, uh, there are tables in the back. You can drop off your ties and your offerings that way. You can also download the Church Center app on any smartphone. You can text 84321 or you can go to cgs.church and click on the giving tab that way. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we are so thankful, God, just for all the different opportunities that we have. Uh, God, uh, so many opportunities to be a blessing to our community, be a blessing to each other, Father God, and uh, honestly, God, just to honor you with, with the things. Uh, Father God, you've given us so much. So God, as we give back to you, God, we ask that you take these tithes and these offerings, God, to further your kingdom. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us this morning. And looks like we're going to have to add another row to the church again. We keep adding rows every other week. Uh, praise God. Well, I'm glad you are here. Uh, it is uh, daylight savings, and so we probably all feel that this morning. So uh, hopefully you all are uh, awake and will stay awake. So I just want to welcome you and, uh, and just thank you for being here and worshiping with us this morning. If you are a guest, thank you for being here. And if you're watching online, thank you for tuning in. Well, let's go before our Heavenly Father and open in a word of prayer before we launch and, and uh, just get into our new series that, uh, that we're going to have here for our Easter season. So let's go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for the day that you've made. And, and God, I just pray that as we go through daylight savings today and we've all lost an hour of sleep, God, that you would just encourage us. God, that you'd refresh us this morning, uh, just spending time in your presence and in worship and now in the word, God, that you'd speak to us, uh, God, that you'd meet us right where we're at. God, we pray for those in need this morning. We pray for those in need of healing, uh, God, that you'd minister to them, God, that you'd bless them. Uh, God, we just continue to lift up um, uh, the situation in the Ukraine. God, we pray for your protection around people there. God, we pray... Uh, Lord, just uh, for all the people in Russia as well, God, we pray that what the enemy has meant for evil and disaster and destruction, that God, you would use it for good, God, that there would be a move of your spirit that would take place. 
uh, Father God, that where the gospel's not been able to go, that God, somehow you would use this for your glory and your purpose, and people will come to know you as their Lord and as their Savior. But God, we speak uh, protection around the people of Ukraine right now. God, we ask that you'd uh, bless them, that you'd meet their every need. God, that you would comfort those that are mourning. Now, God, we ask that you would just open our hearts, that you'd open our eyes. Uh, God, just to receive all that you have for us. Uh, Lord, we look forward to celebrating Easter in, in just a few weeks here, Father God, and, and uh, God, the celebrating the, just the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And uh, God, we're so thankful for the gift of Jesus. We're so thankful for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I am excited about the series that we are uh, starting uh, today. I've never really done an Easter series like this in the, the, the Sundays uh, through Lent leading up to Easter, oftentimes uh, I think I've started something maybe the week before, or just kind of start a series on uh, on Easter Sunday a lot of times. Uh, but what we're going to be doing uh, for the next, well, six weeks, including today, uh, five weeks from five Sundays from now, uh, is going to be is going to be Easter Sunday. Easter's a little bit late, uh, but we're going to be taking a look at uh, different prophecy that was given in. Uh, scripture about the Messiah that was given about Jesus. You know, it took Jesus' death and his resurrection so that once again, we can have direct access to God. So once again, we can have eternal life. How many of you are thankful for that gift? Amen. Uh, so that is what we are going to be celebrating, but we are going to go through the series, and we're going to take a look at prophecy, and I think you're going to really uh, enjoy that. The title of the series is Against All Odds, and the sermon this morning is titled, What Are the odds, because what Jesus did was impossible, right? Jesus did the impossible. What Jesus did was historic. What Jesus did was supernatural. We uh, sang about that this morning. We talked about that in, in life groups, actually. What Jesus did was incredibly sacrificial. I mean, what are the odds that Jesus would fulfill all the prophecies ever spoken, ever spoken about him if he wasn't truly the Son of God. Because Jesus didn't just fulfill one or two or, you know, three or four, but Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy that was ever foretold about him. And so Isaiah chapter 53 in the Old Testament, that is going to be kind of our main foundation. We're going to dig into the New Testament stuff as well, but we're going to use Isaiah chapter 53 as our main foundation as we go through this series. Uh, we're going to all know this, this chapter really, really well. Uh, it's not a long chapter in and of itself, but there is a ton of prophecy uh, that is given. And we're going to take a look at all the different prophecies uh, in this chapter here that Jesus fulfilled. And then on Easter Sunday, we together as the church are going to celebrate the greatest event in the history of the world, uh, Jesus's resurrection. Amen. Because it wasn't just his death. He, he died and he was buried. He conquered sin. He conquered death, but he rose again. And so we have uh, the one and only living God, the true God, and Jesus is our Savior. You know, only God could create the path for us for forgiveness of our sins with the cross bridging the gap so that you and I might have eternal life once again. That's something that only God could do. That's a, a plan that only God could come up with. See, God knew that as human beings that we were dead in our sin. We couldn't pay for the sins that we've committed. So God sent his one and only son to make the substitutionary payment for our sins so that we might be forgiven. In other words, he traded his life for our life. Jesus traded his life for our life. So, you know, it is, uh, we've all lost a little bit of sleep. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we lose more sleep because then we stress that we're going to get less sleep, so then we don't sleep very good. Anyone else have that problem last night? Uh, you knew you were going to sleep. All right, so my wife needs to raise her hand. She didn't raise her hand. We had that discussion this morning. But sometimes you do that. You know, I woke up about five times last night. Don't usually do that, but I think it's because you know you're getting less sleep, and you know you got to get up early, so let's just wake up five times during the night and get even less sleep. So make sure I'll wake up. Let's just have a little fun. I want to ask you guys a few questions this morning. Uh, you know, all of you that are driving age, raise your hand if you've ever broken any traffic laws. Everyone that's of driving age that doesn't have their hand up, you need a savior because you're now <laughs> sinning. <clears throat> you have now sinned, you have lied. 
How about if you've ever rolled a stop sign? You know, yeah. Everybody that lives in the country or drives to the country, which is everybody here, you got to get, you know, this time of year, you can see for miles in every direction at most stops. You know, so I mean, sometimes it's good to get that car down to 10 miles an hour. Let's just be honest. Forget about the rolling stop. It's like, oh yeah, there's nobody coming. We just, well, guess what? If a, if a policeman sees you do that, guess what? You're going to get a ticket, right? There will be a fine for that. There will be a penalty uh, to be paid. You know, we are talking about that in our, in our own family because, uh, you know, I sometimes will roll a country stop sign. And uh, so our children, we now have our third one, who Grace will be 16 here in, uh, in just, what, like a week or two or something like that. And uh, so we've been driving and stuff. So I always got to make sure that she stops in the country because it's do as I say, not as I do, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately. But it's so easy uh, to do that when we are in, uh, when we're driving in the country. How many of you have ever driven over the speed limit, even one mile an hour? See, now I knew I was going to use this analogy this morning. And so I thought last night, after I looked at my notes again, I said, you know what, I am going to drive 55 or under all the way to church tomorrow so I don't have to raise my hand <laughs> when I get to this point. And I get down, and I'm thinking about the sermon this morning. I'm cruising. I look down, and I was doing 59. I'm like, man, I just ruined it. I can't raise my hand. <clears throat> I was trying to keep it 60 and under. How many of you drove over the speed limit on the way to church today like me? Okay, yeah. We are just a bunch of heathens in here. We are all a bunch of lawbreakers. But guess what? If you get, if you get, I miss that. There's always one that knows the reasons to speak. <clears throat> That's great because I come to church every day. 199 is going to be the Audubon from here on out. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. But if you get caught speeding, guess what? There is a price to be paid. There is a ticket that is coming your direction. Or maybe, don't raise your hands for this, maybe you've texted while driving. Please don't do that. That is incredibly dangerous and distracting and can not only ruin your life but can ruin the lives of others. It's very dangerous. But here's the point. If you add up all the costs of your traffic violations for every time that you've ever driven a car, every time that you've gone even one mile an hour over the speed limit, maybe you've made an illegal pass where that solid stripe maybe caught up on you a little bit too quick as you're trying to make a pass on a curvy road and you couldn't get around that slow person in front of you, or you rolled that country stop sign, you would not be able to pay all of your fines. I've been driving for 30 years and I would not be able to pay for all the fines that I have incurred. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to God. God tells us that every time we sin, there's a price to be paid. Think about that. Every time we sin, there's a price to be paid. The moment we sin the very first time, we need a Savior, right? We don't all stay pure, you know, when that like we are when a, we're a little child and we come out of that womb. The moment that we rebel, the moment that we sin the first time, the moment the first time the parent says, don't do that, and the child goes, mm, does it anyways. <laughs> and we all know that first moment, it seems like we're, oh, our child now has a will <laughs> and wants to defy my will. It doesn't matter if we're a good person. It doesn't matter if we do community service. It doesn't matter if we do all kinds of nice things. The Bible says that once we sin, we are separated from God. You know, if you've ever cheated on a test, maybe you've stretched the truth just a little bit and told those little white lies. Every time that maybe we've taken, quote unquote, borrowed something, maybe from work or somewhere else that wasn't ours, um, every time we say something to hurt someone else, every time we've gossiped or let an idle word out of our mouth, every time maybe we've crossed a sexual boundary in our lives, every time we fill in the blank for your life, because we all struggle with sin. Maybe it's an attitude, maybe it's an action, maybe it's the words that come out of our mouth. 
Whatever it is, we all have things that we struggle with in life. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And what are wages? You get wages every week. Wages are your payment. They're the payment for the job that you've done. The wages, the payment for sin is death. And that's what the scriptures tell us. And so just as any one of us who have been driving for any length of time couldn't pay the traffic fines for every violation that we've probably accrued, you know, maybe you broke the law five times on the way to church this morning. I don't know how many stop signs you had to roll through. Or how many times you stopped and started speeding or, um, you know, whatever it is. We can't pay the fines for them. We can't pay the price for our sins because one sin is too much for us to pay. We can't pay for our own sin. So God sent Jesus to pay for our sins, to pay the penalty, to pay the fine once and for all for us. See, God so loved the world, he loved you and me, that he didn't want there to be the separation that existed in the Garden of Eden after man's sin. After man ate of the fruit from the garden, we were separated from God. So God sent his one and only son. He sent Jesus to pay the penalty of our sins. And guess what? It is the costliest free gift ever given. Think about that. It is the costliest free gift ever given. You know, sometimes I'll, uh, you know, I'll give my children a gift or even my wife a gift, and sometimes they realize it costs a little bit more than probably what I could afford. And so instead of just being grateful every time, well, how much did you pay for this? I don't get that. I'm like, I just got you something expensive. It doesn't matter. It was 75% off, right? <laughs> this is how much it costs. But it's the costliest free gift that was ever given. And the only thing that stops us from receiving this free gift from God, this free gift of forgiveness, this free gift of eternal life, is us making the choice to reject it. Because Jesus died for all of us. Jesus, uh, Jesus died so that everyone could have eternal life. God wishes that no one would perish. We truly, we truly have the choice to choose heaven or hell in our lives. We make that choice. We make those decisions. We all have the opportunity to go to heaven when we die. We all have the opportunity to live for God and live with a sense of purpose on life here and now. So hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth, God sent just a series of prophets that you can read about in the Old Testament that talk about what Jesus would do. And one of those prophets was named Isaiah. And Isaiah lived about 700 years before uh, the time of Jesus. Think about that, 700 years. You know, I thought about this, this week, and, you know, I, don't, I can't comprehend 700 years ago. I don't, I don't know about you. You know, it's one thing to think about Heaven and eternity, that just blows my mind. You know, smoke starts coming out of my ears. But even 700 years ago, to think about how far uh, that was uh, in history, um, you know, here on earth. You know, yesterday, uh, as, I was, as I was thinking about this, you know, I realized that the United States isn't even quite 250 years old. And so think about 700 years when we as a nation are not quite 250 years old. No one from 1776 could have predicted where the United States is right now. Now, let's think about these prophecies from 700 years ago. Could anyone have predicted that we'd have the states that we have, that, uh, that, that you know, we'd have the presidents, that we'd have the elections like we've had, that we've got just all the different things, that, the technology that we have, where we would be? Nobody could have predicted this, let alone prophesied like the prophets did about Jesus. So here's a few interesting things about Isaiah. These are kind of the fun facts that I always like to learn uh, as I'm studying. Uh, Isaiah wrote one of the longest books in the Bible, not the longest, but one of the longest books. Uh, he lived one of the longest lives um, of a prophet. Uh, his active ministry lasted 60 years. Uh, 60 years is a long time to be a prophet. 60 years is a long time to be uh, in full-time ministry. And so this got me thinking this last week about my own life and time in ministry. You know, we started ministry uh, together uh, on May 11th of 1998. That means that Cheryl and I will celebrate our 24th anniversary of pastoral ministry this May. 
That's a long time. You know, on some days it feels like it's just started, and other times it feels like an eternity already, 24 years. And, uh, you know, I say Cheryl and I because we've done ministry together. Without her, I wouldn't be here, I'll just tell you that, folks. And, uh, you know, we've done ministry together. I mean, really, in a lot of ways, she, she acts as another pastor here on, uh, for, for us as a church. We don't have a third pastor on staff, and she really functions as that way. And so, but that means that next year is going to be year 25, and 25 uh, is a big deal. So we may have to celebrate or throw a party or have cake or something. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's always, you can never go wrong with cake, um, unless it's got that frosting that doesn't taste good. You know, you know, you know the cake I'm talking about. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, 25 years, you know, I was thinking about that. For me to get to 60 years, I'm going to be 82 years old and having to do full-time pastoral ministry. I don't know many 82-year-olds doing full-time uh, pastoral ministry. So 60 years for Isaiah to do this is, is, is pretty incredible. So uh, this morning, I want to start reading in Isaiah chapter 52. I know we're going to really camp out in 53, but I want to start uh, in 52 because uh, these verses also contain some prophecies about uh, the coming of Jesus. And I want you just to think about how well Jesus' life is described as we read through our passage of Scripture this morning. So Isaiah chapter 52, if you have your Bibles, otherwise all the words will be on the screen behind me. We are going to start in uh, verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 52. It says, See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. Let that, let that sink in for a second. Let me read that again. Verse 14. But, when, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. And he will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence. For they will see what they had not been told. They will understand what they had not heard. Chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was, a, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's plan to crush him and to cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he, yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied, and because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a, of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. There is a lot that I just read there. Thankfully, we have this week and the next five weeks to dig through that and, uh, and to uh, kind of unpack 
all of these different prophecies. But there's supposed to be about 24 different prophecies that are recorded here in Isaiah. You know, we're not going to look at all of them. Uh, we're going to look at a few of them in depth as we go through the next few weeks. Uh, but I just want to scratch the surface uh, just a couple of them this morning. And it'll really give us, I think, just a, a glimpse of where we're going to go and what we're going to do as we go through this series. And so what we just read here in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 are prophecies. They predict, they foretell, they prophesy. Isaiah was prophesying about what was going to come with Jesus, with the Messiah. And here's the cool thing. They are all 100% accurate. As we read that and you thought about the life of Jesus, if you were a follower of Christ, did it depict Jesus' life? Does it depict the things that happened to Jesus? Yeah, it does, right down to a T. And so we see here that God is going to save people from their sins. God is going to save the world, you and I, from our sins. During Jesus' earthly ministry, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies about him. Think about that. He fulfilled over 300 prophecies about him. And 700 years before Jesus of Nazareth came to earth, the prophet Isaiah recorded like 24 of them here. What are the odds? Now you see where the series is coming from. What are the odds that that would happen? Well, I'll tell you the odds. If he wasn't Jesus, the odds are like this. Zero. Let alone one, two, three. No, zero if Jesus isn't truly the Messiah. If Jesus isn't truly the Savior of the world. Look at Isaiah 53, 3 with me. One of the things that we see is that Jesus was despised and rejected. Verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. We, we know that this prophecy is true. We know that Jesus was despised and rejected. We know that the Sanhedrin, during the night on uh, uh, and Good Friday, before that took place there, that, 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 that the Sanhedrin denied. They rejected him three times during the trials. And we know that the people rejected Jesus when Pilate uh, asked if, if he should release Jesus or Barabbas. What did the crowd do? They cried out for Barabbas, the murderer. And we're going to look at that again in the coming weeks. And actually for Jesus, what did they do? They crowded crucify him. You know, Pilate tried to appease uh, as a good gesture for the crowd over the Passover. And instead of choosing Barabbas, they rejected him. They despised him or, and, they, and they chose Barabbas over Jesus. Another thing we saw that we see here is that he bore our punishment. In Isaiah 53, 4, it says, Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. Now, I really don't care for the NLT translation right here. I, I, I preach a lot from the NLT. Uh, it's not always perfectly accurate. Uh, you know, we got to go back to the original Greek and Hebrew and break it all down to always get a perfectly accurate in uh, translation in today's language. But oftentimes it's easier for us to, uh, to understand and uh, be able to, uh, you know, know what was being said. But the NIV here actually gives a better translation. Here it says sicknesses and diseases in the NIV. And that's, that's a much better translation. So if we were to read that again, we could say it was our, not weaknesses, but it was our sicknesses and diseases that Jesus carried. And we know that this is true for Jesus really from the very first days of his ministry because everywhere that Jesus went, he healed people, right? He, he bore their weaknesses. He bore their sicknesses and diseases because he healed them and Jesus spent time with them and Jesus ministered to them and he consoled them and, and, and he counseled with them. And, you know, I know from my own life, just when I spend time counseling and, and ministering to people, sometimes you feel that weight. You know, sometimes you, you feel that. We don't go through life alone and as a pastor, you, you feel that weight and you... Um, you know, you, you, you help people carry those burdens as they go through life. And then ultimately, Jesus bore our punishment once and for all 
when he was crucified for our sins. Another thing we see in Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8, it says, He was oppressed and he was treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of many people. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew records that, that during Jesus' trial, that he never defended himself, that he never confronted his accusers. And, and you know, that is pretty amazing in and of itself, that Jesus never confronted his accusers, that he remained silent. And we're going to really look at that verse, and we're going to look at that point in depth uh, next week. But here's what I love about this. Jesus taught us how to walk the path of injustice. Jesus showed us that we don't have to defend ourselves. And, you know, I know that runs right in direct conflict with what the world tells us, right? Because, you know, when someone says something about us or something, uh, someone, you know, makes an accusation about us, what do we want to do? We want to defend ourselves, right? It's my right. Well, it is, I guess. But we don't have to. Jesus showed us that there's a, a better path. You know, oftentimes if we spend our whole life defending what people tell about us, we're going we're gonna to not live the life that God's called us to because we're going to live our whole life on the defense. You know, that's, that's a real tactic of the enemy to, to get us to just have to defend ourselves and defend different things. Now, that doesn't mean that if you make a stupid choice, you know, if you get a ticket, you know, and you're told to go to court, you better go, okay? Yeah, go and, and, and talk to the judge if that's what you're called to do. But as we go through life, if, if people make an accusation uh, about us, we don't have to defend ourselves. But the world tells us to do that. And oftentimes as human beings, we feel compelled to tell our side of the story. Oftentimes in life when someone tries to attack us or to attack our reputation or, or spread rumors, you know, we want to go on the offensive and the defensive, and we want to attack back, right? Or at the very least, we just want to make sure people hear our side of the story. Because there's always two sides to every story, right? But guess what? Live your life and let people see the other side of the story. That's, 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 that's good wisdom. Don't defend yourself. Don't attack back. Don't have to get, you don't have to get the last word. Let people know you for who you are. Let your reputation speak for itself from the way that you've lived your life up to that point of someone making an accusation against you. We don't have to confront our accusers. We don't have to defend ourselves. Uh, we can take Jesus' example. Simply move along in life and allow God to take care of it for you. Amen? It's a good way to go through life and to live life. Because in life, people are going to say something bad about you. I know you're the perfect person. You know, my mother-in-law is that way. She doesn't watch this stuff online, so I can talk about my mother-in-law real quick. <clears throat> I don't think. But my mother-in-law is one of the sweetest, most godliest people in the absolute world. Just, just a sweet, sweet human being. So blessed to marry into the family uh, that I did. But she had, she actually still has a neighbor uh, that lives right next to them. They end up having to put up a privacy fence and stuff because this, this, these people that live there just did not like my in-laws and just did not get along with them. And my mother-in-law just for years just like, I don't know how she can't like me <laughs> because she really didn't have a problem with her. And, and they really weren't, the, my in-laws really weren't the cause of it. Uh, you know, and they just loved on them anyways. You know, take them over some baked goods and, you know, and still this person just did not like them and, and does not care for them uh, for whatever reason. But she just could not comprehend that somebody wouldn't like her. But it doesn't matter how good of a person you are. It doesn't matter how loving you are to someone. You're always going to find people that don't like you. That's just a fact of life. There's always going to be someone that for, uh, for whatever reason might not care for you. So do you give fuel to that fire? Do you, do you attack back? Do you get defensive? Do you try to defend yourself? Or maybe we should walk the path of injustice that Jesus showed us 
and just do what the Bible says and to love one another and to even love our enemies. Now, they may not be, you may not be, they may not be an enemy to you, but somehow if they're treating you that way, they're treating you as an enemy. Because in life, people, unfortunately, even sometimes Christians, even sometimes in the church, people can act unjustly towards us, right? Because we're all human beings, right? And we all have bad days. And I think every one of us has said something about somebody in our life, maybe even someone in a church, and go, did that just come out of my mouth? I'm so glad nobody else heard me say that. Am I right? Okay, and so we all can be guilty of it. We all can do that. We all can let something slip if we're not guarding our tongue, if we're low on sleep, if we've had a bad day, if something tragic has happened in our life. We can all say things that uh, sometimes we really don't mean, but it comes out and we say it, and it can be hurtful and, and it can harm someone. But that's why we're called to forgive, like God has forgiven us, amen? We're called to walk in grace. We're called to show love. And oftentimes the best thing that we can do is to offer forgiveness to someone and just to keep moving along in life. Keep uh, doing the things that God has called us to do. Put down the offense and live the life that God has called you to. All right, our last verse this morning, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. It says, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, He will be satisfied, and because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all of their sins. Because of what Jesus accomplished by dying on the cross for us, by conquering sin, by conquering death, by rising from the grave, we, those of us who have given our life to Christ, those of us that have professed our faith in Christ, and we choose to live for him. We've, beca- we've, we've been counted righteous. We have been forgiven. We become justified because Jesus paid our price once and for all. As we go into the series, we're going to g- dig into the Old Testament, and we're going to look at sacrifices and things like that that, that that had to be made in the Old Testament times. See, Jesus' death was historic, as I said when we started this morning, it was supernatural. It was incredibly sacrificial to think about that. God sent his one and only son. I've got one son, and I'm not putting him up for anyone. Right? I got three daughters, I'm not putting, I wasn't sacrificing them either. If anything, mess with my, mess with my girls, and I will have a great prison ministry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Dads, you know, nobody's going to harm our, our spouse or our children, right? We'll defend them at all costs. But what did, what did God do? He sent his one and only son to die on the cross for us so that we might have life. And what Jesus did was prophesied. It was predicted in Scripture so that no one could say it happened just by chance. I mean, what do people do with with, uh, with so many things in life, you know, uh, just creation in general. Oh, it just happened by chance. Yeah, right. And so all this stuff is recorded in Scripture about what would happen with Jesus' life and what he would do and what, how he would be treated and what he would accomplish. All of these things are recorded. Over 300 prophecies, over, over 700 years before Jesus was born. Again, remember, think about it. The United States hasn't even been around for 250 years. How many people could have prophesied that today in 2022 that we would have our 50 states, that we would have the technology that we have, that we would have a mini computer in our pocket that can record stuff, take pictures, you know, text people. My goodness, people are blowing up my phone. Look at that. No one could have predicted the technology that we have today. Nobody could have predicted our president. No one could have predicted all the different things that we have. Yet, look what was recorded in Scripture. Church, it's simply amazing. Jesus' death was historic. It was supernatural. It was sacrificial. And it was predicted 
What are the odds? Again, the odds are zero if he's not truly the Son of God, if he's not truly the Savior of the world. So we are going to celebrate uh, Jesus' resurrection here on Easter Sunday, and I pray that you will pray about who God would have you invite uh, on Easter Sunday uh, to worship with us. And, you know, like I said, we're going to go, this is going to be a, basically, I think, a six-week series if it's going to take us up to, uh, to Easter Sunday. And so the great thing about this series is even though it all ties together, every week is going to be independent because we're going to take a look at a different aspect of prophecy. So even next week, invite someone out, uh, get them in on the series because a lot of times people will doubt God. You ever doubted God in your life? Sometimes we wonder if God is real. Uh, we, can, we can doubt, did that really happen? Well, when you see things prophesied 700 years beforehand, and then we look to the New Testament and we see things that happened in Jesus' life and how it played out, it makes it a lot easier to see that God is real. It makes it a lot easier to understand what God has done for us in the life that Jesus lived. And so uh, I want you to invite your friends to come on out and join us during the series on Easter Sunday to hear the story about the God that loved them, the God that died for them, and the God that rose again. Amen. I want you to stand up on your feet, and we will close in prayer this morning. Uh, before we close in prayer, just want to remind you, uh, if you weren't here, even if you were here last week, we have the, the H&I sign-up sheets. Uh, they are in the, they're in the foyer at the Welcome Center. They're on the back tables. Uh, would you please fill those out and let us know how you could help serve at Harvest Network International this summer in June. Uh, if you don't know what that is, come talk to me, uh, my wife, Pastor Jeremy, Alicia, come talk to us, or you can watch the message from last week and you'll hear all about it. Also, we have a number of our, our church projects, things that we are trying to get done uh, before we begin our summer uh, slate of ministry of Harvest Network, summer camp, and VBS. And those, uh, those forms to help, to sign up, to be able to help are out in the foyer on the tables along this back wall here. Uh, would you please take a look at those and pray about how you might be able to help uh, in those areas as well before you leave this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for Jesus. God, it's just amazing that you could have, that there'd be so many prophecies, over 300 prophecies about the life of Jesus, over 700 years before he was born, and every one of them was fulfilled. And God, that's because you are the one true living God. Jesus truly is the Son of God. Jesus truly is the Savior of the world. And so, God, we just pray this morning, God, that you would just work on our hearts. If there's anyone here that doesn't know you, God, may today be the day of salvation. God, we ask that you would use us this week as we go to school, as we go to college, as we go to work, as we go to the store, God, to tell someone else about the greatest gift that they can have, and that's the gift of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you. There'll be prayer teams up here this morning to pray with you. If you have need of healing or if you'd like to give your life to Christ, we'd love to pray with you this morning. God bless you. Go in peace and have a great week.